Uh, thank you all four of you. That was fascinating and in lots of ways very inspiring. Um, these are particular kinds of businesses, aren't they? I mean, it's just worth saying that a lot of the work that I guess Business Action for Africa and DFID and we have done has been in oil and gas or mining, uh, where very similar opportunities arise, but obviously slightly different technologies and modes of organisation. Some of you might have expertise on those areas. We've got a good uh, half an hour for discussion. We're going to run over a bit because we started late. Our usual rules of engagement apply. Please remember you're on the record. Stand up, say who you are. Um, and say something rather than ask a question because that way we'll have a better conversation um, and any good stories are always especially welcome so who'd like to go first uh, lots of hands up why don't we start at the back for a change we'll take one two three four five six uh, right behind you Leah please no <laughs> try again My name is Simon Berry, um, and in my spare time, I run a uh, campaign called Code Alike, which you are very generously referred to. Um, what uh, Code Alike wants to do is it wants Coca Cola to open up its supply chain, or its distribution chain, I should say, to take social products like um, oral rehydration salts, mosquito nets. Uh, vitamin A tablets and so on. And uh, while we've been campaigning, we've been thinking, and uh, this is a sort of thing we've come up with, this sort of pod that would fit in between the necks of bottles in um, Coca-Cola crates. Um, it would be replicable throughout the world while allowing local determination in terms of what's required locally. Um, there's about 8,500 of us on, uh, in this campaign, and we're all gathered on a Facebook group, and it ranges from logistics experts to um, public health people working on the front line on um, rehydra or rehydration projects, for example. This is not a project against Coca-Cola. I mean, when you say to people you're really a campaign, they sort of step to one side often because they think you've got some sort of disease. But this is, um, this is a campaign for Coca-Cola. We want to make it easier for Coca-Cola to take a little step outside of the comfort zone that we, was described earlier to do something a bit risky, uh, really innovative, uh, which could have extraordinary um, impact uh, on, on, on public health. So the question at the end of all that is um, to Ewan, um, does he see as part of the um, program of trials that he described um, trials of this cola life idea taking place in Tanzania before the end of the year? <laughs> Ewan will give you a chance to think about the answer to that very specific question. Yes, please. Over there. Next. Yeah, hi. Um, Gabor from Accenture Development Partnerships. Um, great presentations, very inspiring. All of them talked about the need for partnerships uh, with many different stakeholders, but particularly with NGOs. Um, what are some of the, the, the challenges that you've experienced in either choosing partners globally or nationally uh, and, and some of the, um, the ways that you get around these challenges of working with particularly large NGOs? I've got to say, if you want yeah, to be controversial, I mean, I, I think there are some challenges and I think there's, there's going to need to be some, name, some fairly... Name three, just so we get the conversation going. Uh, I think there's cultural challenges between uh, business and NGOs still. I think there's capacity challenges and I think there's technology challenges, yes. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. We, we, yes, down at the front here. Hi, I'm Ida Horner from Ethnic Supplies. I work with women involved in handicrafts and textile in East Africa. Um, one of the things that's very encouraging tonight is um, the idea of sharing skills and capacity building. And on the question of in decreasing internal costs, um, story to tell, um, I was in Kampala in September last year. Anyone here from Sachi and Sachi? Good. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Sachi and Sachi um, have a program, a CSR program, and um, what they don't realize is that something they could do very, very easily and free of charge 
is not to pay someone to take away their old calendars and brochures because right next door to them, a women's group I work with goes down the market and buys these to produce beads that I help them find a market in Europe. So if you're looking for a way of saving costs, how do you get rid of your rubbish? That's where to start. So Sachi and so just I've lost the Sachi and Sachi connection. Explain that to me. They they produce calendars or they throw calendars they, away? They, or? Um, they are advertisers and marketing and PR and whatever it is they do. Internally, they have calendars, they have magazines and whatever else they do. Once it's out of date, they pay someone to take it away. And next door, in a slum of Kampala, the women need those magazines free of charge to make some beads and necklaces. Which is surplus to requirements. And yeah, wasted. absolutely. Yeah. Right, so good. if you want to cut internal costs, look at what you do with your rubbish. Very good. I'm doing this side first. I'm going to come to the other side in just a second because there were a few people. There, were, there was one, two, and three, and then we'll pause a minute, please, at the front. Good afternoon. My, hello. Yep. My name is Stephen Olushan. I represent myself. This question is for... <laughs> yes, I represent myself. Uh, this few question is for the, uh, Mr. Cadbury. Uh, what... Uh, <laughs> The question is just a few questions. What are you people, what can you do for the eradication of uh, malaria fever in the production farm? You made mention that you are, spending, you are investing around uh, 45 million in Ghana. So what are you going to do? Maybe to invent a chemical to, to, to wipe away the mosquito. And secondly, what are you going to do? What is your plan? Because the way the people carry the, the cocoa fruit on the head, will you make improvement for the next 10 years for the pro production of cocoa? Those are my questions. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. And be immediately behind you there. Yep. Uh, hello, Jack Needham from PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, I've got a, a short statement, but, but more of a question, really. Um, probably directed, David, at you, um, being um, the, the person who maybe has the most obvious set of competitors in sourcing cocoa. Because my, my sort of line, a bit on, sort of following Gib a bit on the partnerships theme, is we've heard a lot about partnerships, less about partnerships amongst competitors. Um, I was managing the Business Linkages Challenge Fund for DFID, which had an explicit um, partnership um, agenda. But even with that, within that donor funded program, there were very few examples of partnerships between businesses that were actually competitors. There were lots of good examples of supply chain partnerships in the, in the way that we've um, heard today. So I'm, I'm interested in what, the, what are the challenges to those um, partnerships. We had one good example in, in Vietnam um, run by IBLF, um, which was Pentland and Nike working together to address um, the standards in, in factories in which they procured in, in Vietnam. So that was a, an example that, 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 that worked well. But I'm interested in the challenges as well. Thanks. We had one more, two more quickly then on this side, and then it'll be time to come back to the panel, then we'll do the other side. Uh, Graham Baxter from uh, <coughs> IBLF. Thank you, Jack. Um, <laughs> delighted to see three of our member companies uh, on the panel, but you represent the giants reaching down to touch these tiny farms and small holdings. And my question is about managing the internal costs that Caroline referred to and the transaction costs to ensure that you don't crush these tiny, delicate, sustainable communities from your great positions of power of the brand. How do you achieve the delicacy, the subtlety that you've demonstrated is necessary? And most importantly, how do you sustain that rather than to succumb to the inevitable pressures of economies of scale and, and large scale transactions, which is what big companies and big brands really do most well. And IBLF has an answer? It would be partnership, of course. <laughs> Thank you. And there's a lady behind you, I think. Um, Jayanti Thirai, Monroe and Foster. My question is really for Coca-Cola and um, S.A.B. Miller. Um, to what extent do your development impact calculations include those businesses, jobs, and brands that have been lost as a result of your improved market penetration? 
Yeah, thank you. That's a question I wanted to ask as well. Uh, let's just, just go along the row. I mean, Caroline also raised some quite serious challenges about this. You know, on the one hand, it's incredibly attractive. They're really good stories. They are genuinely inspiring stories. You know, and on the other hand, there are these kinds of questions about how difficult it is to do in practice, about the need for partnerships, about the problems of people who might be displaced in the informal beer market. Um, um, and you must confront those every day in the business. And it's particularly interesting to think about how you sell this to your chief executives and to your, to your boards when you're doing this, and how far it is really about the business case or whether it goes more broadly. Why don't we work along the row, starting at this end? Do I need to stand or do you, am I okay uh, to as stand? As you wish. Stand, because okay, it, stand it's a big room. Um, I'll pick up a few of those and then um, leave the real howitzers for my colleagues. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I, th I think a couple of things I wanted to pick up from what Caroline said and, and then just one or two of the questions. Uh, the first thing about why it's, this isn't happening more often and why it's not seeming to happen more often um, is that I think it, it is happening but slowly and the reason it's happening slowly is that these, the, the successful models take quite a long time to build and I think it's for, there are a number of different drivers. So for our business, um, the drivers are very, very local. And so one of the key challenges is our managers on the ground, and we're an emerging market originated business. Um, so in a sense, people are very, very adept at working in their markets. They know them very well. And in fact, we're not, I wouldn't, although we are a giant, if you want to call it that, we're a big brewer. We're, we're a business that's built bottom up, genuinely through the way we're structured. Um, and so it's all about the, the capability of those managers taking a procurement decision, just like it is in, in other areas of sustainable development, like a, an engineering decision and the impact it has on water. Um, really understanding not just the cost of the project, the payback of the project, how they'd normally run a project um, in, the, you know, in the normal business world, but how, how can they think more broadly about development impacts. And I think that's a, it's a slow process and it's a learning process. Um, and I think the broader sustainable development debate and particularly the climate change angle and the water angle for us are things which are helping open people's eyes a bit more to also the development side. Um, on, that, on that piece around the um, looking more broadly though, there is a very different culture in, in global NGOs to local NGOs to businesses. And we see it in, in many of the partnerships that we have, have built around actually delivering business services and also in some of the partnerships in just some of the research that we have been doing and we are doing. Um, and, and the particular thing is that as soon as the business does agree this is a good thing to do, it accelerates its delivery of it because it buys into it. And this is a direct challenge, I think, and a direct problem for those who then want to do a load of deep analysis to really understand whether the development impact is, is good or not and how it can be slightly improved and everything else. And so the reason we did the, the, the review that, in a sense, from a development perspective, was, was quite quick and dirty, actually. Um, I mean, it involved, I don't know, something like five to ten days on the ground in each of the markets, quite a lot of interviews, and, and then was actually, we knew the business already had got the sense that the, this smallholder sourcing model was a good one and was beginning to accelerate it. And we wanted to make sure that when, when we did, in different parts, the world. We were actually informing it with some, with some analysis. So I think there's a particular point there. Okay. Well, that's, I'm happy with that. Um, <laughs> let me just pick up one more one then, which was this, this, this kind of the, the tougher one in a sense about the, the, who loses their jobs when, when we grow. I think, I mean, there's, there's a number of different aspects to that. First of all, yes, uh, in, a, in a simple trade-off, people who are brewing illicit alcohol, home brew, whatever you want to call it, who are selling it outside of the formal system may sell slightly less of it because of us selling a more formally brewed product. However, um, it's a product that will be formally regulated, a product that will have to com 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 um, you know, be aligned with all of our responsible alcohol stuff around how it gets marketed, around who it gets sold to, around the, the standards around that. Um, it will be a product that will be taxed in some way and therefore there will be an additional revenue stream for government. Um, and so I think that of course there will be some trade-offs there. Um, what's most interesting is the majority of the, the farmers in our value chain, the smallholder farmers, are people who were previously subsistence farmers. So in Rajasthan, it's people who often, who always own actually three acres of less or land. In um, Uganda, the, the land area is often about an acre and a half. So they don't make a huge amount of direct money out of it because they may only, may only sell us a tonne, a tonne and a half of sorghum a year. But actually that may double, treble um, even more their income. And so it's, it's that, that's where Graham's point around the subtlety of engaging with them is very important. Because particularly if, if your value chain is responsible for suddenly washing someone with cash in a way they haven't experienced before, even if it's just a, a small amount overall, that's quite a challenge. What about all these the women brewing maize beer who were suddenly displaced because S.A.B. Miller has arrived in the village, um, which was the question. 
Yeah. Well, what I, I guess what I said is, there, there is yeah, there is a trade-off there. And we're, a, we're in a business in a competitive market. I'm not denying that. And we haven't we haven't quantified and, and done a huge amount of research on the the disbenefit for informal beer suppliers. And just while, while you've got the floor, before we hand on, are you inspired by this Coca-Cola distribution model? Because you're talking about you know the inputs, and they're talking about the distribution. Why don't yeah. you distribute beer the way they distribute? Uh, uh, Coca-Cola. <laughs> no, no. Well, that's all right. I'll, no, no. I mean, that's the. No, we do. We, we're we're one of the five largest Coca-Cola bottlers, particularly in South Africa and, and Central, um, Central America. And in fact, we do have that MD system being being developed in Zambia. Um, so, absolutely. Um, actually, if you look at the the value, the kind of value chain, total economic impact stuff I talked about, all, always for our product, um, the biggest single jobs impact is in the distribution phase. Second, you know, supply chain second, uh, and we're doing a lot of work in that. So MDC for beer as well as for Coca-Cola, or just for Coca-Cola? No, no. We also have um, different distribution methods for beer. We've got a very successful um, scheme around training taverners and then and then onward distributors in South Africa called Maclasetti, okay. and it's it's in the report, which very I didn't publicise before, but you can pick up on our website. Okay, thanks very much. No Let's pass on to David. Thanks, Andy. Um, <clears throat> where to start? I suppose, first of all, the, the sort of question of um, why isn't everybody doing this? Um, I think there are questions of scale. I think there are questions that people will raise about cost. I think there are questions um, that are really tough to answer because it's about knowledge. And, you know, I don't stand here and, and purport to be a development expert. And actually, I don't know many businesses who would say they are business uh, development experts. And so what you're asking is a really difficult question for a business to answer. And there aren't many forums where you can get hold of that knowledge in a way that helps you develop something that's perhaps not quite as threatening as people might think or whatever it might be. Um, so I think for me, the big, the big challenge is businesses don't always know what the answer is and don't know where to start. And, you know, things, this sort of conversation, I think, is helpful in trying to shape agendas and, and give people guidance and advice. I think that's very useful. I mean, just as a matter of fact, sorry to keep interrupting everybody, but uh, who are the other people who buy cocoa? Nestle, presumably, and who else? Well, uh, let me come on to that, because they talked to one of the points about partnership. And, you know, to, to a certain extent, uh, the cocoa industry has a very strong um, collaboration going on within industry around certain parts of the challenges that have faced the cocoa sector. And um, all of the uh, big chocolate companies and the big cocoa processing companies are part of the International Cocoa Initiative and trying to tackle the worst forms of child labour. Um, it's a slow process, it's getting there. Um, but that for me has been an excellent example of being able to convene a multi-stakeholder group and engage with regional governments in Côte d'Ivoire and in Ghana. And uh, yes, it's slow progress. Yes, we would like to see it go faster. Uh, but it is making distinct progress in an area where up until 1999 hadn't had an awful lot of attention, if we're honest. And I think part of that comes back to knowledge. You know, knowledge about the base of the supply chain. Perhaps they should have looked. Perhaps we should have all looked a bit more detail, but we didn't. Uh, perhaps it's about knowing what the answer is. And certainly, um, the answer isn't something that exists in any individual chocolate company. So I think partnership does exist, um, and we're seeing more of that, stuff like the Gates Foundation approach, which is collaborative within cocoa sector, uh, helping to create longer-term livelihood solutions in five different countries in, in West Africa. Um, and then beyond that, the sort of barriers to that are, well, you know, people trade in different ways, people's supply chains differ, uh, just because five companies buy cocoa doesn't mean to say they all buy it from the same place. And there are distinct differences in supply chains and in the models that businesses run. So it isn't quite as simple to say, you all buy that, let's all work in the same way. Um, you know, there are subtleties within that. And, of course, competitive practice starts to play out in this game as well. Um, to my friends, I presume from Ghana's question about what can Cadbury do to cure malaria. Well, you know, to be honest, it is one of the key things that the Ghanaian team highlighted. Um, Cadbury isn't going to go and start uh, finding new drugs for malaria, strangely enough. Um, what it might do, though, and what we are doing, is creating community infrastructures where education about malaria can take place, where the sorts of preventative measures can have a better chance of sticking and sustaining themselves in rural communities that where the outreach from any other healthcare facilities is limited to non-existent.
Now, you know, Ghana has somewhere in the region of 750,000 cocoa farmers, um, most of whom are in fairly remote areas. It's very difficult for them to reach, to be reached. They don't have much um, healthcare support. And so, you know, challenges of malaria and education about malaria are really uh, tough for them to meet. And building community infrastructures, or more to the point, helping those communities organize themselves into infrastructures that give them a stronger community uh, perspective is a core part of what the Cocoa Partnership is trying to do. And from that infrastructure, other opportunities start to, to thrive, whether it's in terms of, of trade, as in the, the fair trade conversation, or whether it's in terms of education or healthcare or just rural infrastructure. And some of the examples that we've seen have come out of the ICI uh, work has definitely shown communities working very effectively together, being able to represent themselves at local council levels in a way that they weren't, weren't able to before, and as a result, secure for their community and all the members of that community um, the benefits that are starting to happen um, that the government's development program is putting out. But they are still few and far between. And the challenge there is scaling up. Uh, Cadby's currently working with 100 communities, so that's give or take 10,000 cocoa farmers, so 60 to 80,000 uh, people in those 100 communities. And of course, the Quapa Cocoa Cooperative is 50,000 farmers, and that's where the fair trade cocoa is coming from in the first instance. So you know, the opportunity to start to reach out to a lot of people and create scale change comes. But that's challenging. It takes a lot of setup. It takes a lot of um, organizational setup. And um, it takes resource to do it. And I suppose that brings me to the final point, the question of you know, how does uh, collaboration between the different partners work? Um, I can't stand here and tell you it's been easy. There are cultural differences between businesses, between NGOs, between the United Nations Development Programme, between the governments whom we work with. Um, I have learned a whole new definition of bureaucracy from working with the UNDP, and um, I'm certain they would say the same about working with Cadbury as well. Um, you know, we all bring organisational baggage with us and actually getting those things onto the table and saying this is what we're trying to achieve, these are the things that we have to achieve with it and just being upfront about that is pretty important and I don't think we learned that lesson fast enough uh, but I know there are a couple of our partners in the room so I'll let them tell you about okay. that perhaps later on. David, thank you very much Ewan. Uh, tell us what you're doing in Tanzania about this thing. Well, that, that, I things. mean, that's the, the easy one. And uh, Simon, yes, that is the plan. So I'll move on to, to other <laughs> ones. But um, <laughs> I think there's enough provisos contained with that is the plan in a business context to say. No, that, I mean, in a, seriously, as, as, as Simon knows, and obviously we've, we've, we work, that is absolutely the idea. I think I referred to the, the five areas. Those are all areas that we want to pilot and trial out with, with a variety of, of, of means to see that. And the, social, the idea of distributing health products is something we want to try and, and try and succeed in doing but as I say I, I, I think I referenced earlier we want to make sure there is a sustainable business model behind it the right partners there it's not our core business and we're not going to get into the core business of, of health products but we are very happy to work with the, the, the right partners to make sure we can leverage our own distribution expertise to ensure that, that that can be done so the answer is yes that's the plan to do that how that looks in the end I'm not sure but we're very keen at the end of the year to have recommendations we can roll out in all of those key areas. Um, so, I mean, the other ones that I'll, I'll touch upon, I think I'll, I'll go to the, the one around the, the development, the impact, and, and do we understand the, the negatives, if you like. I think, to pick up on that, the honest answer to that would be no, we probably don't right now. I don't think enough work has been done on that. We've all been very good, I think, at running and organizing um, economic multiplier studies that very much focuses on the job multiplier effect and distribution and supply chain. We haven't necessarily even got the metrics um, or the right partnerships in place to look at what that does. The gut feel when I look at what, what all three of us have presented here is there are net benefits overall, but we know when we move to a manual distribution system, for example, there's going to be truck drivers who no longer have jobs or certainly don't have jobs as truck drivers anymore. But then I know SAB Miller and, and others also have very innovative schemes around owner-driver schemes in your own distribution system. So there are different models, but I think the honest answer is no. In, in terms of the debate we have here today and, and the wealth of experience, we 
we need to understand those more and we need to start measuring not just economic impacts but social impacts as well so that we have the right measurements. The challenge there is everybody wants to develop their own model and they want to patent it and then they want to sell it. And the problem is if we end up with 50 different measurement impacts on all of these different things, A, we won't want to do them because they won't be efficient, but B, there will be no way to actually measure one against the other. So I think there's a challenge for all of us in this broad sustainability and development sphere to work out actually we need to collaborate. And that brings me to the partnership piece. I spent all of my career until two years ago working in the development sector. I wouldn't ever call myself an expert in anything, um, but I, I do know a bit about development and I also know a bit about the development sector. And I now know a bit about business as well. And I think the challenges are the same whichever side of the road you're on or side of the divide or whichever particular view you've got, there is not enough collaboration. There isn't amongst the big aid agencies or the NGOs or the development community, and I think we all know that. There isn't in the private sector either, and that's I touched upon that earlier. Business to business partnerships are key. I think there are some challenges for working if you want to get us to work with competitors. Some of them are obvious, and we're not going to give away the secrets to our own successes to a, a competitor of whatever size. That doesn't make business sense. There are also a lot of laws that were set up to make sure that we didn't collaborate around pricing and other things that are actually barriers as to us to collaborating too closely in others. That said, there are already great examples of where we can do that. I think the business call to action is a great example of where we can start to share experiences and share that. And other initiatives, I think one was, was, was already talked about, but we, like many others, are members of the Better Sugarcane Initiative, where we do sit with our competitors, with partners, with suppliers, and work out how can we tackle the issues around sugarcane in terms of child labor, in terms of water, and other environmental challenges but I don't think we're there yet and I think that's a challenge for everyone in this room and beyond very and I think when we talk partnerships very quickly is we tend to and I know we're guilty of this look for big global NGOs that tend to be based in the the geographic north and I would say and I'll speak for Cope we've not always been that good at looking at who are the local partners and the local NGOs and the local groups who actually understand what for example the the issues around water are in a particular locality so I think we need to get better and I also I think global NGOs and global Global development agencies need to get better at working out how to do that. And the final one, I, th um, yeah, I think that was probably it, actually. I'll Good. leave it there because there's other. We're going to finish in six minutes. I'll take two or three on this side, but you get one sentence each and you say something. There won't be time to come back to the panel. You've been very patient. Uh, Zahid, you wanted to say something, and we'll take two others, and then we're going to stop. So the lady there, please, first. No questions? No. Oh. One, se one sentence. Time is rushing. <laughs> Okay. My name is Nora El Ghuli. My interest is in uh, improving access to essential medicines in, for the bottom uh, billion, basically, or bottom two billion. And I would very much like to ask you some questions offline. <laughs> All right. Okay. Zahid, do you want to come in? points that came up, I'll just um, put them to you. Uh, the first was how we move from having incidental development benefits to making this part of your core um, corporate strategy and thinking. So how we move into your core business. And the second one was uh, from uh, a company, another company that says if a company is interested in doing this kind of sustainable, sustainable supply chain work, who should they speak to at ODI or DFID? Very good. We have an answer. To that. We'll take these two. The lady there, please. Yep. Fiona Gooch from Tradecraft, and we also run the Responsible Purchasing Initiative. An observation. <coughs> None of you are purchasing directors or managers <coughs> or distribution manager or director. That's just an observation. We set up the Responsible Purchasing Initiative in recognition of the negative impacts caused by purchasing decisions that meant that it was impossible to bring about better livelihoods if you price at a level that cannot meet a minimum wage or you set your lead times in such a way that you're forcing overtime. That's just an observation. And what we've done is we have produ produced guidance for people on how they could do it better. And that's on our website. And also we've provided an online game for buyers who've never bought or never traveled abroad on how to buy responsibly. And it's a game. Very good. What uh, I would like to say is we haven't discussed structural problems. In the UK at the moment, we have four companies that dominate all of food sales 
Uh, and that effectively means they can dictate the terms to their suppliers. And I think that's just an observation. We've talked about the positives. We haven't talked systematically about how the negatives are being perpetuated in supply chains. Right, will you do me a favour? Post a blog on the site for this series with a link to your materials and including the game, and people will be able to follow it up. The gentleman here. Uh, Phil Sigley, uh, Federation of Cocoa Commerce. Just to come back on the point about uh, companies not being development agencies, uh, we know who the development agencies are and we seem to have some, some tremendous difficulty in engaging with those agencies despite all our efforts over recent years. Now there is a particular model that we are working on in the mainstream which I can send to the gentleman from PwC which is in fact to address the, the key problem of infrastructure in the, for example, in Ghana, district assemblies or in Côte d'Ivoire, the department. And that really is to address the capacity issues that are lacking. And it doesn't mean that a community has to necessarily be dependent solely on, for example, cocoa. It can be more collective. Uh, I would like to spend time on this, but we haven't yeah. got that time, so thank you very much. But we do have other meetings in this I'm going to stop because I'm worried about your time. But is Mavis here? Where is Mavis? Oh, Mavis, sorry, there you are. Uh, Mavis is the supremo of much of this and one of the core partners, Mavis Owusu Amfi from DFID. Thank you, Simon. Um, I think, can you hear me? Sorry. Okay. I think today we've heard some excellent examples of the impact that multinational enterprises can have when they focus on their core business models and try and support value chain development or distribution, um, um, distribution um, development. Now, these initiatives have been positive. The impact has been excellent, um, but we still have a challenge of scale. Um, as Simon pointed out right at the beginning. Last month, the focus of the discussion was on market development and the models that development agencies and civil society organizations are using. And again, the same challenge came up, scale, sustainability, impact. Today, we heard about the impact of job creation. Most of the figures that were cited were tens of thousands, and on income levels, they talked about millions, tens of millions. Last month, the impact was hundreds of thousands of jobs and tens of millions of income. The challenge is about creating tens of millions of jobs and tens and hundreds of millions of income opportunity for the poor. So we have a very, very, very long way to go in terms of scaling up and moving forward with this agenda. A few things struck me in the discussions today and also the discussions last month. Everybody talked about what has been achieved has been achieved through good partnerships. But if you listen to our discussants, sorry, our presenters today, the partnerships were around business to civil society to community partnerships for delivering, okay? And last month, it was very much around development partner to civil society to community um, partnerships. I did not hear a lot about business to business to civil society to development partnerships. I know it's complicated. I know it's difficult, but this is the only way in which we are really going to achieve the scale that we're looking for. We need the different models that have been piloted around the world to become the basis for co-learning. So my suggestion for going forward, and I really hope colleagues will come up with ideas on the blog, because in DFID, one of the things we're trying to do is to think through strategically how we can work with businesses, with civil society, with government, and with communities to achieve the employment challenge that we face globally right now. So the challenge to everyone on the blog is suggestions on how we can deal with the problems that we have in forming the business to business to development partner to civil society to community partnership. Because if we can address this partnership, this partnership problem effectively, what I've heard today is that we actually have some very good business models out there and they are working very well. 
And we have some very good donor models out there. And we have some very good civil society models out there. We can start sharing those models, not just within a supply chain, or within a value chain, or within a community or a country that a donor is working in, but across sectors. So the challenge we have about trying to use the successful distribution model that we've spoken about on Coca-Cola and SAB Miller to address the medicine challenge that we have today. And that's just one area. There are a number of models that can be cross-shared. Technology transfer is critical. How can this partnership facilitate better technology transfer? The third area is... Time. Forgive me, thank you. Um, there's a lot of research being done, there's a lot of data out there, there's a lot of experience out there. We can start sharing those experiences. So I really hope that we will get some feedback on the BAA website and thank you all very much for coming and we look forward to seeing you at the next session. Thanks, Mavis. Just before you leave, I mean, just the thing that to take away this thought from, from, from Cadbury's, you know, you might do this because Gordon Brown rings you up for the business call to action, or even because Shriti Vadera rings you up, which is at least as persuasive. But actually, you do it because if you don't do this, you won't have a business in 10 years' time because the cocoa sector is going to collapse. I think that is a really powerful thought to take away from this session. The other thing to take away is that this is operating right the way up and down the production system, and it's not just the kind of the fair. meeting on the 12th of May. I'm really impressed at the stamina and, and the fact that we've generated so much interest that so many of you have come to many of these meetings. It's a tribute to Business Action for Africa, for their organisation and to the ODI and DFID colleagues who put it together. Uh, thank you all very much for your, for your stamina and for your contributions, but please join me in thanking the speakers.